Welcome YouTubers, this is Necro Arcanist XIII in association with Bandit 1569, bringing you the next chapters in Book 1 of the Necrosis Chronicles, Hell's Crusade. If you have not yet watched chapters 1 through 12, then do so now to avoid spoilers. Previously on Hell's Crusade, John meets up with his old friend Mikey and helps him bury his family who were killed by the Empire after a racial cleansing census was passed, meaning that anybody who has the blood of a foreign country must be killed to keep Australia pure. After returning home, John receives a call from Brian stating that soldiers are attacking the pub, and after the Necros annihilate the soldiers, they are attacked by a titanic robot called Atlas, who single-handedly wipes out the opposition, including Adele and Vincent's new scions. Hecate and Leviathan. Jack is killed when a laser cannon duel literally backfires in his face, and John avenges his death, only to be defeated by the robot Atlas's explosion. John is then shot in the head by an elite, leading to my mid year double episode special, Hell's Crusade Chapter 13 and 14 Jailbreak and the Lords of Salem. John awoke in a glass case and found that he was sitting next to Brian. Bri, you're here, he moaned. Am I dead? Thought you were for a second, replied Brian. John hung his head in despair. Oh, Jesus Christ, no. What is it? John slowly lifted his head up and turned to Brian. Jack, Jack's gone, man. He's torn to fucking shreds, man. Brian was shocked. For the first time, he actually saw John shed a tear. And that's bloody heavy, mate, he said. Brandon smacked his head against the wall. We've got to get out of here and avenge him. But where the fuck are we? asked John. Some sort of laboratory. Don't know who else is here, but I'll say this. They took your opal thing. John looked down to see that the opal in his chest was gone, replaced by a gaping hole and a thin membrane through which John's heart was barely visible. Took more than a drill and a pickaxe to mine that gem, said Brian. We've got to get it back, exclaimed John. I've got no idea how to manage to separate the damn thing from me, but I'm powerless without it. I still got mine, said Brian, but there's too much artificial terrain here. Unless there's a group of vermin running around I can befriend. John stood up and began punching the glass. No good, said Brian. Diamond alloy. John could see the bladed opal through the glass, sitting on the table, and he tried to reach for it. Even though the orb could recognise its owner, at best it could glow and shiver. If only I had me scythe, said John. I could cut through the whole bloody building in a single sweep. They got the Necronomicon as well, said Brian, so we got no magical backup. I thought you could memorise it. Only while I'm reading it, I can instantly find any page in seconds. John had a thought. Is the wall, roof, or floor diamond as well? He asked. Wall? Yes. Floor? Yes. Roof? Can't reach to try. John jumped up and spread his legs out to hold himself in place while he fell at the roof. Glassed over, he said. If only we had a source of sonic vibration, like a high-pitched bass note. John felt around in his pockets and found a very large whiskey flask. Better than nothing, he said. John managed to down half of the entire flask in a single breath. At that moment, two scientists, both wearing helmets fitted with gas masks, walked into the room, heavily focused on the opal. This is an amazing discovery, said the first. The radioactive output is great, replied the second, but it has no negative effect on humans. Instead, it warps the genetic structure. We'll be billionaires. The two heard a tapping noise and looked up to see John staring with the infernal gates in his eyes. Both men shuddered. Creepy, said the first. I wonder why he's not dead yet. I don't know, replied the second. The elite who brought him in said that even though he removed consciousness via gunshot, unconsciousness was able to make it lash out at him. Too stubborn to die, I guess. Brian banged on the glass. Hey, you have no idea who and what you're dealing with, he said. I swear to God that if I get out of here, I'll shove your head so far up your asses you'll be wearing yourselves as hats. Ignore it, 
said the second man. It's primitive and vicious. You might catch rabies from its breath. Now, at this moment, I might actually want to give you a little warning that I forgot to give in the intro. The next scene is very, very dark. Turn your volume down if you are easily startled by horrific descriptions. You'll be alerted when it is safe to turn the volume back up. John nudged Brian, whispering to him. Brian, if you're going to threaten them, be a bit more specific about what you're going to do. If you want to make them leave, you have to be psychotic about it. Something serial killers can't think of. Something that despicable. It sickens you to the very fucking soul. Yet you have to say it because not only your life, but the lives of everyone you care for rely on you getting out. John then tapped on the glass. Cover your ears and watch the show. You say something? Asked the first man menacingly. Before he could even repeat his question, John immediately started up with a threatening tone. Yeah, I said something. What are you going to fucking do about it, mate? I said that rabies is going to be the least of your problems because when I get out of here, you know what I'll do. John softened his tone, which actually seemed even more menacing. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. You've always got families. Any wives or kids? What about them? The two men asked in unison. Well, I'll tell you just what I'm going to do when I get the fuck out of here. I'm going to hunt you down, right? Right down to the very sheet you sleep under. I will hunt you down and carve you into little bits. I'll siphon your blood and stomach acid out with a hose into a bucket. Then I'll rip your eyeballs out of your sockets and shove them up your asses so that you can watch me kicking the motherfucking shit out of them until you bleed to death. Then I'm going to take your vital organs, wrap them up in a jumbo sized valentine chocolate box with a big red ribbon, all dyed and painted with some of your blood and send them off to your wives in a mail. Until then, I'm going to stalk your wives and your children and I'm going to paint messages and taunts over everything they own in more of your blood. Then, once your wives receive the little gifts in the mail and faint from shock, I'm going to string your kids up from the tallest tree in sight and skin them alive, using the skins to make leather suits stuffed with your minced up flesh. Then, while your wives are still passed out from the shock, I'll dress your wives up in the child skin suits and crucify them to the wall over the front doors of your houses for everybody to see before throwing your stomach acid over them by the bucket load to burn them alive. Then to finish it all off, I'll take what's left of your blood and all over the walls again for everybody to see. I will write a curse that until every last member of your family dies out, they are doomed to suffer tragically fatal misfortunes that even I cannot comprehend. Two men started to gag, rushing out of the rooms as their masks filled up with their own vomit. Brian uncovered his ears and stared in amazement, never taking his widened eyes off of the spot where the two men were standing. Just so you know, he said, I heard all of that. I have a few things to say. One, I don't think we should be friends or family anymore. Two, I'm having a panic attack being this close to you. And three, Brian turned to John and punched him in the face with a critical hit that sent him down to the floor. Never ever do that a fucking gamble for as long as you live. John stood up straight, removing his hand from his face to reveal that his mask had been cracked by Brian's fist. I promise you that, he said. 4. Just so I'm clear, have you ever actually done that? No, but I saw it on CSI Miami. Then I found out three days later that somebody actually went and done it up in Launceston. John took out his phone and began pushing buttons. What are you doing? asked Brian. Well, I suggest a high pitch bass note, said John. Singers don't really have any high pitches we rock out with a really deep bass. My ringtone works quite well. The phone dances like a mosh pit if I have it up loud enough. I might want to cover up. The vibrations from this will have the wall shaking more than an overweight man's flab in a 91 Richter earthquake. John then began pushing more buttons. Don't you mean 9.1 Richter? asked Brian. No. Brian ducked down as John held his phone up over his head and let loose a sonic boom that blew apart the glass and cracked the walls in the room. Brian stood up and examined the damage. Good thing the wall exploded outward, he said. 
Sure enough, the wall was still mostly intact, but there was a hole large enough for Brian and John to slip out of. John grabbed his apple off the table and inserted it back into its spot. It began to glow, as if it were happy to be reunited with him. Brian then turned around to see the pair's equipment sitting on a shelf behind him. They collected up their belongings and set out to find the others. So what are we going to do? asked Brian. We don't know where anyone else is. At that moment, John's phone went off again, blasting the wall. Jesus Christ! John turned down the volume and put the coal through. Yo, Hey, it's Stan, man! Stan's voice trailed off suddenly as if he were talking to somebody else. Hey, he's alright. I got Bob and Red here. Red? Yeah, the demon guy. I can't get his name right. Spearin? Yeah. We're outside of Mikey. He tracked us down. He intercepted the truck that was carrying us here and let us out. So you're outside? Mikey got the details on where everyone went. Stan went silent for a few seconds. Everyone but Jack and Adele are in there with you. John went silent. Dude, are you right? Jack's dead, replied John. Atlas got him. Everybody went silent, and even the background noise coming from Stan's end went silent. Shit, came to reply. Yeah, there's nothing we can do now, said John. But we can get out of here and plan our next move. It's half off running into this one blindly. Make your way in, Brian and I will get the kids and we'll catch up with you lot. Right then. John hung up. Let's go. John ran out of the door in a random direction with Brian in close pursuit. Muttering, I just hope the kids are fucking okay. Meanwhile, the three brothers were on the opposite side of the building, unconscious and floating in jars filled with a translucent green goo. Raziel awoke looking around half dazed to gain his surroundings. He could barely move as he was hooked up to several machines that were tied around him, as if he were in a spider web, being cocooned for said spider's meal. He tapped on the glass and woke Dante in the process. Raziel then used his fingernail to scratch a message into the glass. We have to get out, can you break the glass? Dante smiled and nodded and he tried to kick at the glass wall, but all he did was manage to break his toe. After several minutes of Stafford screaming in pain, Dante got over it. Then he turned to Raziel and scratched the message using the quartz in his hair. I'll wake Fathead up. See if there's anything you can do. Dante began tapping on the glass next to Vincent's jar, while Raziel looked around his side of the room. It was practically bare bones apart from an x-ray machine and pictures of the boy's wings nailed to a wall. He was not too sure about the other side but it seemed that their jackets were draped over an examination table. Raziel looked down to see that he was still wearing his onyx necklace and tried to cast a spell, but sadly, the goo was too moist for Raziel to conjure a dark flame. So he tried to scratch another message on the glass, but his fingernail snapped, the noise of which alerted Dante. Raziel then stuck his next finger up, at which point Dante frowned, holding up both of his hands with the same gesture. Raziel tried to smack his head in frustration, and showed Dante that he was scratching at the glass to try and crack it. After a few minutes, Raziel eventually managed to crack the glass so that he could reach out of the jar. Once the goo had drained out, Raziel poked his head up into the clear space and managed to see clearly that their weapons were placed on the same table as their jackets. He tried to reach out of the gap and his sickle blades magically appeared in his hands. Raziel could not be more delighted and slashed out the wall of the jar to his heart's content. At that point, Vincent woke up at the noise of scraping and realised where he was. Pushing his arms against the wall, he broke out of the jar and fell to the floor. Raziel then kicked out a circular section of the wall that he had cut out and landed near gracefully, then he cut out Dante's jar. The boys clothed and armed themselves before heading out, and Dante spat out a large blob of goo onto the floor. I cannot believe that this great beast has been caged, he scowled. The government don't like hippies, Dante, said Raziel. Vincent then swung his gun blade around, happy to be back in action. Hey Vincent, called Raziel. What is it, Raz? replied Vincent. Nice job on the sign there. I like the way that you went up against that thing with the heart of a lion. Vincent appeared stunned. Heart of lion? he asked. It means to be brave. Vincent looked down at his blade. Heart of Lion. Lion Heart. Vincent began to swing his sword around again. Vincent the Lion Heart. I like it. Vincent grabbed a scalpel off the examination table and handed it to Raziel. You right, 
I can't. Raziel took the scalpel as Vincent held his gun blade as if he were presenting a fish that he had caught, and Raziel skillfully engraved the word Lionheart into the blade in cursive writing, followed by a detailed depiction of Leviathan. Vincent then looked at Raziel's handiwork. Snake? Lions not snakes, they kitties. Your sign is a snake, Vin. It's like when they had our names on the roster at school, remember? They had our last names, then our first names, so it's like that. If you're Vincent the Lionheart, I put Lionheart first, then the snake, which represents you, second. I see. Raziel's smart, not like me. You're smart in your own way, Vincent. You know how to break walls with your head. I don't. At that moment, Dante could hear a noise coming down the hallway. Three scientists and a soldier went past the door with a wheelie bed that was covered over with a blanket. Let's hurry to the autopsy room, said the soldier. I can't wait to figure out what makes this dog talk. Dante threw his katana through the window, impaling the soldier through the head. Vincent then ripped the door apart and Raziel decapitated the scientists. Dante then ripped the blanket off of the gurney to reveal Saberfang, who was passed out. He's bloody warm, commented Dante. There should be a morgue freezer nearby, said Raziel. It would be nice and cold for him to recover, and there's older corpses he could eat. You've got a twisted mind. There's no time to waste. Let's go. Raziel jumped on top of the bed, and Vincent kicked it across the hallway. Raziel began to steer the bed like a surfboard, grabbing a map of the laboratory on his way, and looked for the morgue, with Dante and Vincent right behind him to take out any of the soldiers they passed. Raziel ducked around the corner, only to have an elite stand in the way. Vincent, mid-strike, grabbed a bottle from a water dispenser and took a big sweep before bowling it at the elite's head, disorienting him. Dante then used his katana like a pole vault and leapt across the hallway to the elite, kicking him out of Raziel's way, before landing on the bed. Seeing the freezer just up ahead, Dante planted his katana into the ground, slowing the bed to a stop. Raziel jumped off and opened the door and Vincent carried Saberfang inside. As Vincent came out, John and Brian came running from the left and everybody else from the right, just as the alarm began to sound. Where's Jack and Adele? asked Dante. Dead and missing, replied John. Where's Fang? Knocked out. He's in the freezer, but we shouldn't worry about him. Where is Exit? asked Vincent. Behind us, replied Stan. We gotta move now. Everybody took off towards the exit, but an emergency lockdown door was slowly closing before them. As they rushed towards the door, the wall in front of them exploded only for Saberfang to rush out, holding a half-rotten bone in his mouth. Saberfang, in true Indiana Jones style, slid under the door and dropped his bone, only to grab it before the door shut itself. Vincent, in his own style, rushed ahead and drop kicked the door down. The entire group then ran outside, where John's car and bike were waiting. John jumped into the seat of the bike, with Saberfang and the kids in the back, and led the car, driven by Mikey, out of town. Mikey then sped up so that he was driving alongside John. We're in Hobart, he called. It's going to be a long drive. Can these old things handle the mileage? The fuel don't run out, Mike, replied John. I'll explain later. Suddenly, the conversation was drowned out by a familiar speech, and a familiar crane fell out of the sky, and it latched onto the car and the bike, dragging them into the sky. A jet plane lifted the vehicles into the specialised bay, and once inside, the group were greeted by the CIA's agent Tanya, and Dante immediately jumped at flirting with her. Have you been gorgeous? Drop dead, she replied. I've been telling them that for years, commented John. Asshole never listens. Well listen then, gentlemen and asshole. I have been instructed to inform you that Agent Jack foresaw his predicament and therefore signed up for an experimental procedure. And what procedure would that be? asked John. Experimental arm, leg and brain transplant? Tanya sighed. No, he's signed up for the cybergenetics program. If you wish to see him, be warned. It's quite shocking. Everybody looked at each other, then ran past Tanya into the main area of the plane cockpit. There was nothing there apart from a puddle of melted metal on the floor. Suddenly, a shape began to emerge from the pile, and it formed into Jack, who was now half cyborg. I learned that trick from watching Terminator 2, he said proudly. Jack's missing limbs were replaced by robotic arms and legs, but his hands and right foot were still intact. The visor that used to cover both of Jack's eyes only covered the left, 
and he was still wearing the tattered suit he wore upon his time of death. But apart from everything else, he was the same old Jack, who began to dance around singing, Guess who's back? Back again? Jackie's back? Run as fast you can! Interrupted Dante. John smacked him upside the head. Well, protested Dante, he's that ugly his mum will smack him out at sight of him. Vincent then smacked Dante in the back of the head and began laughing. John then hit Vincent. Don't hit your brother, he said, you'll hurt him. But you did it, argued Vincent. I'm your father, it's my job. The plane slowed down to a halt over the base and lowered the cranes, placing the bike and the car on the ground outside. John then went to leave the cockpit, stating, we'll rest up, then we'll go look for Adele. Everybody left the eagle and slid down the crane cable, landing in the backyard. As they walked inside, Rosio noticed that the clump of blackened dead grass had rotted away, revealing a bare patch of cracked dirt. Dante was the first one inside and noticed that the TV was still on, showing a woman reporting Atlas's attack on the town. The destroyed chassis of this mechanical monstrosity lies in tribute to whoever was strong enough to destroy it before it leveled the entire town. But, because they have been detained by government officials, we will probably never know who it was. If this truly is a conspiracy cover-up, then several questions must be answered. Is the destruction of a memorial landmark truly necessary in the Emperor's efforts to cleanse the nation? Are the deaths of the seemingly innocent families truly necessary to keep civilization flourishing? And is it worth paying the ridiculously expensive taxes when, in the end, we wind up purchasing our own demise? John sneered. She's got a point, you know. If everyone stops paying taxes, it'll cripple the empire. It should spread the word. Dante then poked his head through the kitchen door. There's only one beer left, he called. Gotta go get some more. Upon hearing that, Vincent, Luke, Stan and Jack all rushed out to the kitchen and tackled Dante to the floor to fight for the beer. John then turned to Brian. That's your job, he said. Why me? replied Brian. You're a witch doctor, you know more about herbs and shit and all that stuff. More than I do anyway. Hell, I'll bet you can even brew a beer that cures liver and kidney disease. Is that getting you down? Well, well, let me kidneys buggered. I think I got shot by the bloody elite. That's one bastard I wouldn't mind. Ah, uh, scratched out, you tormented enough hearing at once. Also, I think I got a crick in my spine. Well, I can have a look at that. I was a medic in the army. Turn around. John turned around and lifted his cape up, then took off his arm to reveal an art gallery's worth of tattoos and scars. Brian felt around John's spine and found, partly due to John's screaming, that part of his upper spine was broken. Vertebra must have shouted out, said Brian. The bits are cutting you up. You might want to bite down on something, it's going to hurt to take him out. Brian took his knife out and carved a small section around the area where spikes of bone were pushing their way through the skin. Then, Brian picked the shards out, one by one, before sewing the wound back up with threads from his robe. John then put his armour back on and stretched. That's a bit better, he said. You should be a bit more careful from now on, replied Brian. Your spine's not designed to friggin' rub against itself like that. Ah, give me a week, it'll grow back. Unless you bleed out. What? Bloody stitches must have popped when you put your armor back on. It's going everywhere. John quickly took his armor back off. I knew that would happen, said Spearin. Here, I will cauterize it. Spearin ran his claws along the wound, burning it. John made no noise, but the pain made him shiver uncontrollably. Still better than the butcher there, he said. You do a good job ripping people's backs apart, Brian. Brian pushed John away and sat down. Hey, it's not my fault, he said. This not used for cutting spines, not fixing them. Spine cutter. It's not a bad name for a blade, is it? Why well, have Phoenix talents? commented Spearing. Raziel then sat down next to Brian. Vincent decided to name his gunblade Lionheart, he said, after his self given title. Vincent the Lionheart? asked John. Makes sense, although due to his sign he should be the Dragonheart. That's not a bad idea, said Spearing. We should name all of our weapons and give ourselves titles like the warriors and sorcerers of old. Not bad, replied John. Now I'm thinking Vincent should have been named a Kraken. Brian was confused. Why the hell would you name your kid after a slimy creepy monster? Well that way if he ever gets captured I could say, release the Kraken. 
Brian laughed. I did see that coming, but the payoff was worth it. Well, said Raziel, I still think that titles are an idea. Dad's known as the Arcanist, and I could be the Assassin. Jack then walked into the room, happily holding the last beer. I think we all know who's the Terminator, commented John. If only when he died, he had the time to say, I'll be back. Jack began laughing sarcastically. Says to one who's just screamed like a little bitch, he said. Hey, 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 you got torn in friggin' half by that Atlas, of course I had to make a scene. How did you know your own son didn't die? Because he wasn't torn in fucking half. He's a subhuman vampire, plus he's the son of the man who voted too stubborn to die by everyone. So an explosion ain't gonna kill him that easily. Jack flipped the cap off the bottle and drank the entire contents in one breath. Ain't that gonna corrupt your circuits or anything? Asked John. Or would ancient people of Baghdad used alcohol and fermented fruit juice to make batteries? Replied Jack. That's pretty much how my systems run. I can even still eat shit, but I can't get any nourishment off it. Suddenly Dante, in a fit of rage, came screaming into the room. Jack extended his robotic arm to over three times its original length to punch out Dante, who collapsed to the ground. Well, that's gotta hurt, commented Brian. Jack then turned to John. Aren't you gonna do anything about that? He asked. He's an ass, replied John. It's the only way he learns. Spearin and clapped his hands together and pointed both his index fingers at John. So, Arcanist, he said, what is our next plan? Regarding the damsel in distress? Asked John. I was thinking her knight in shineless armour can come up with a plan. Can't take all the credit for the intellect in this bloody household. All eyes, including those coming from the kitchen, turned to Raziel. At that moment, an ear-splitting cracking noise started to echo as the ground started to shake. Everybody ran outside to see a floating island rising in the distance. It reached a considerable height and it began to move towards the mountains in the distance. Well, that's a bit high, said Jack. And I sent the eagle to the shop again. Finally figured out what caused the screaming noise. It turns out part of the GPS was faulty. And the influx of data at high speeds caused a static burn on the electronics. And the sound of the electricity sparking was the source of the noise. Well, I've got an idea said Marky. I found a vehicle graveyard that's used to dump all the further experimental technologies. Give me and Jack a day and we'll have something awesome for you, I swear. At that moment, a mail van pulled up in the driveway. Saberfang began sniffing at the air. Did you put any cologne on Dante? He asked. No, I swear, replied Dante. John walked up to the mailman, who simply said, Letter for you. John took the letter and the mailman walked away. John then pulled a lighter out of his pocket and set the letter on fire without even opening it. The envelope burned away, but the letter inside was untouched. As I thought, he said, It's an old brand of perfume that has the same fireproof property as asbestos. I only know one person who wears this stuff. John flicked open the letter and showed it to the group. In large, seemingly blood-soaked letters, read, Come find the Lords of Salem followed by a pentagram symbol that pointed upward. Well, I'm off, said John. He began to walk away. Where the hell are you going? asked Dante. Salem. That's in America, though. I got my methods. John walked for about an hour down to the aerodrome where the military were keeping their aircraft. John sneaked into the area, careful not to alert the guards. These idiots are so pathetic, he thought. The guys at Area 51 were a lot smarter than this. Acting cocky, John began to dance around to avoid spotlights and cameras. And he was singing in his head. After a few minutes, John spotted a guard up ahead talking on his phone. Look mama, it's not a big deal working out here. The boss says all I have to do is walk around this catwalk and look out for intruders. John grabbed a loose puff and began sneaking up on the guard. Timing his movements, as he sung. John smacked the guard in the head as hard as possible to pipe, knocking him out. Before the phone even hit the ground, John picked it up, and a lethargic nasal voice came down the other end. Are you okay, baby? John cleared his throat and, be and tried to reply in the guard's own voice. Yeah, mama, I dropped my gun on the floor. 
Listen, Mama, I have to talk to you later. Somebody's trying to get in. Love you. He's trying to hang up the phone quickly and put it back on the ground before cleaning out his ears with his finger. Now that's what I call mental torture, he said. I feel sorry for this poor schmuck having to put up with that shit. John quickly placed the pipe on the floor and started to quietly run away, searching for a control room. He quickly found it and began listening in on the people talking within. When are we going to receive another order to send the planes anywhere? Asked the person. I don't know, replied a second voice, but the boss is really paranoid about this terrorist scandal. John peered into the door and noticed that a plain sheet of paper and a pen was sitting nearby on the desk. He took them and quickly wrote out a fake order. He then looked around and there was a small cavity in the wall nearby, like a mail slot. He shoved the paper into the slot and waited for the results. And hey, what's this? Finally! What's to say? What's to say? Highly urgent confidential mission sent a single craft to Salem, Massachusetts to search for a suspect terror spy who escaped in a hot air balloon. That doesn't sound legit. Well, the handwriting checks out. Look, it even has the ink block signature. John looked at his hand to see that the pen was leaking and he immediately dropped it. We'll send Stealth Pilot 32 to deal with the terrorist. I'll notify him and he'll make some coffee. John sneaked out of the building and made his way to the hangars. He noticed that there were different kinds of hangars, each painted with a coloured stripe. Shit, which one's the stealth craft? He asked quietly. Suddenly, he heard an engine power up inside one of the blue striped hangars and immediately rushed inside. John caught sight of a large plane about to take off and ran as fast as he could. Without alerting any guards, up to the plane and crawled inside the landing gears as they retracted. Curled up inside the plane, John used his phone to keep track of where he was going. Eventually, the GPS told him that he was over the Salem area. I think I can fly down from here, he thought. Using all his strength, he forced the landing gear open and pushed open the door to the compartment. He squeezed his way out of the plane and began to dive straight down, but there was only one problem. Shit, the air's too thin! John tried his best to hold his breath, but he passed out in mid-air. After a seeming eternity, John managed to wake up and he was still airborne. He could see the town of Salem just up ahead, as well as the plane he caught a ride on. There was a large white hot air balloon sitting next to it, and it suddenly went up in flames. The plane began to move, so John thought up of a clever idea to avoid detection. Using the lighter in his pocket, he set his wings on fire, then he closed them up around him, fully encasing himself. The clever disguise appeared to be a falling meteor burning up in the atmosphere, which nearly took out the plane on its return flight. John was travelling faster than a falling meteorite, however, and he crashed into the ground amidst the forest. Battered and half broken on the ground, he jumped up and stretched his wings. No more flying for me for a while, he muttered. I've seen kamikaze pilots land better than that. John then looked up at the night sky. Now which way do I go? John held out his hand and his scythe appeared with a small burst of energy. He stamped it on the ground twice and the blades folded up, changing its appearance to that of a battle axe. Slipping it into a holster hidden under his cape, he set out into town. Walking amongst near empty buildings, he was hoping for some nightlife. Eventually, he saw an old man in an old trench coat pushing around a merchant cart. He tried to run away at the sight of him. The man screamed out as loud as his lungs would allow for help, which in reality were not truly that loud as he began to cough and choke with the wheeze of a heavy smoker's breath. Calm down mate, said John, I ain't gonna hurt ya. The man stopped trying to run and breathed a sigh of relief. Oh thank heavens, he said, I thought you were one of the lords. The who? The lords, the lords of Salem Town. They're the devils incarnate. John crossed his arms. I'm from Australia, and these lords have sent me a letter requesting a meeting. I was wondering if you could tell me where they are. The old man began to shake. Nobody knows who, where, or what they are. You have to be a madman to want to see them. Only a few people around here have seen them in person. Many have gone mad with what they learned. Many more died tragically. A few have just simply vanished. I don't know much more, I'm just an old man trying to make ends meet. John reached into his pocket and flicked out a gold coin, which landed in the old man's pocket. 
this is payment for any information you have left, he said. It says $20, but in America, I reckon it'd be only worth one. Charity nonetheless, commented the old man. I thank you. Now, those few with enough sanity left to speak of the Lord said that on the nights of a full moon, a thin stream of smoke pierces through it like the needle through an eye. This all started a few weeks ago, and I cannot mention the events that followed. Alright then, one last thing. Don't show the man his note. Since you're a merchant, can you tell me anything about the perfume on this letter? I only know one person who wears this, and I believe she's involved. The merchant hesitantly snatched the letter and sniffed at the perfume stones. Oh yes, I do sell this. It's called the Burning Passion. For its imperviousness to flame. It'd be a pretty little number who paid top dollar for this when it was popular. But she and some of her friends disappeared the night before it began. Faves often break into their houses on the edge of town near the entrance to the woods and often claim that they walk the earth. Legends have it that either they are the lords, or the lords are something else, keeping their souls trapped to safeguard their belongings. The local high school children have started a rite of passage for those who started this year, and it is for one person to break into the houses of those who have gone missing, steal any items, and tag a partner to put them back for the next night. I say it again, if you really, really wish to meet them, then you would have to be a madman. Thanks mate. And just for your information, I'm a veteran of two wars and a part-time mercenary. After the things I'm seeing, I'm surprised I'm not a madman. I'm a veteran of three wars myself and I'm scared out of my wits. You're a brave soul. And I bid you good night before the lords find me outside and take me away. The old man hurried along with his cart in tow, and John gave him a small wave goodbye. Looking around, John found the house that the man had mentioned. It was small and white with a blue steel roof. He noticed a broken window and saw a shadow moving around inside, and decided to investigate. John tried the front door, but it was locked. He looked at a broken window next to it and tried to open it. When that did not budge, he saw that it had a lever style lock on the other side. John reached in, careful not to cut himself on the glass as somebody had apparently done so before, and flicked the lock down. He silently opened the window and climbed inside. The walls were coated thickly with mould and mildew in every object inside, including the floor, was holding up its own weight in dust, making them difficult to identify. John stowed several trails of footprints in the dust. Most of them were heavy boot prints like his own. But one set was much smaller, like a high-heeled shoe, similar in shape to Adele's. John wandered around the house semi-aimlessly, investigating every room he came across. But they all mostly looked the same, due to the dust. At that moment, he heard something like a chain scraping across the ground. He carefully listened for the direction that the noise was coming from, and headed that way to find a staircase that he crept up in absolute silence. He peered around both corners and spotted somebody going through drawers in a room to the end of the left hand side of the corridor at the top of the stairs. John thought that this was an intruder and decided that, seeing as he appeared to look like one of the lords, he would use his natural charm to scare them off. Carefully sneaking up, John waited until he was right up close, then he just stood still with his arms crossed, watching the thief go through several clothes drawers and find a jewellery box, placing any items of interest in a satchel. Eventually, the bandit turned around to reveal it was a teenage boy with freckles and short black hair wearing a hooded jumper. The jumper had a sigil of a two-headed skeletal vulture, and was studded all over the chest area of metal pins. Looking up to meet John's soulless gaze, the boy dropped his satchel, screamed, and leapt out of the window, falling to his death out of sheer panic. John then picked up the satchel and replaced all of the stolen belongings, 
then when suddenly a whispered voice echoed throughout the house. Who dares? John turned around and, in an ironic scenario, nearly bumped into a woman in a torn dress, standing behind him with the same crossed arms and soulless death stare. Her entire body was white, apart from her long messy hair, high-heeled shoes, eyes and lips, which were a deep black. But John simply returned the soulless gesture. Cut the crap, Brooklyn, he said. I know it's you. The woman was surprised and rubbed her eyes. Jesus, John, is that you? How'd you find me out? I could smell you coming. What the hell are you playing at? Everybody thinks you're dead. I have to make them think that. It's part of the pact I've made. Pact? The Lord's of Salem. I'm a member, but this is still my house. Normally I just sleep in a hammock in the basement, but every now and again some kids want to be heroes break in. Well, some old guy back there claims it's the right of passage for the kids to break into the haunted houses. Shame for that idiot back there, he impaired himself when you pick a fence. Oh, damn. Well... Anyway, normally I get my makeup done whenever I come back here. Brooklyn tore her hair off to reveal that it was just a week, and her real hair was whitish blonde. Weak contacts, eyeshadow, lipstick, and a lot of body paint, she said. We can't wait to gig ourselves. Everyone's doing it. So I'm guessing you got our invitation. John held the letter out to show Brooklyn. I'm guessing you can take me to the Lord's Den, he said. Just give me a minute, I'll have to get dressed. Brooklyn left the room and entered the first door on the left. Minutes later she came back out wearing a hemp robe that was in worse shape than Brian's. In her hand she carried a long staff with a bayonet tied to the top. She then tied an old blindfold around her eyes and pulled a hood up over her head. Let's get going, she said. Brooklyn led John out of the house and into the woods. So you're a Lord of Salem, he asked. The High Priestess, second only to the Grand Matron. So how many of you are there? There used to be five of us, back when we were a normal coven. Ah oh, yes, I remember the Samuel, Samael, that's right, Samael incident. I know, we've all been here by that bitch. Anyway, after that we left for Salem and we lived quite happily here. During the day we lived rather average lives, working average jobs. I taught history at high school, you know. We recently met our new fifth member, Morgan, and she moved here from Britain. I hardly understood her Cockney accent, but she was really nice. At night we'd abandon our houses and have fun out in the woods. Practically an outdoor sleepover. John began laughing. <laughs> pretty much witches gone wild. Brooklyn laughed as well. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Normally we just light a bonfire and sit around sharing any ghost stories, but we did celebrate our own festivals properly. Like the equinoxes, solstices, and All Hallows Eve. That was a big event. Also, the only time of year that we could walk around in our costumes and not get persecuted by the police. But the drunks were a bit of a problem. Bloody clawing ass like dogs fighting over raw meat. Anyway, about a week ago, Morgan was murdered. She was running from her father, actually, who was trying to kill her. John was stunned. Hang on. Jack works at the CIA, and he helped a girl who was in witness protection for the same reason. Well, can you remember what she looked like? It could have been Morgan. Teenage redhead with a brown shirt and a black skirt? Yeah. John was stunned even more. Well, her father was killed in an accident, so who could have tracked her down and killed her? Nobody knows. We think it was either a friend of her father's or a mercenary hired by him. Either way, the bastard lives out here. The four of us formed the Lord's Salem and terrorised the town, putting curses on anybody we suspected of the murder. However, but it was nothing too serious, mind you, but we definitely scared the crap out of him. And you haven't found this dude yet? Sadly, no. Without our fifth, our power is worthless and our divination is false. We'll come back down under. You won't believe the magic my band of rebels has been using. Oh, we know. Just before our powers diminished, the Grand Matron foresaw a vision of, as she said, spirits of great power who shall lead us down the path of vengeance. Among them, a horseman of the apocalypse, a great she-angel, and the terror of the deep. You have no idea. At that point, 
John could hear chanting like an eerie opera in distance. That's the girls now, said Brooklyn. I remember that tune, said John. It's the same as the lullaby I made for the kids. If I remember correctly, I heard it on one of my old games. And we've turned it into our prayer for serenity and tranquility. The two headed into the clearing where the lords were waiting. Three robed and hooded figures stood with their heads bowed. On the ground was a pentagram symbol, and each of the points was a different colour. The yellow and red points were clear, and in the centre a cauldron stood bubbling. Three differently shaped spears, seemingly to correspond to their owners, stood in the dirt, the bladed parts touching over the cauldron. However, a fourth spear, embedded in the dirt of the red point, stood without its owner. It had a star-shaped blade, making it look more like a magic wand. Upon hearing the footsteps approaching, the Lord stopped chanting. Brooklyn and John stopped in their tracks. Priestess, you have brought the arcane wizard, the Freeze said. I, sisters, said Brooklyn, in the flesh stands the undying heart of chaos. The three women lifted their heads to reveal that they were wearing makeup exactly the same as Brooklyn, but they wore different masks. One witch wore a jeweled masquerade mask shaped like a butterfly. The second wore the upper half of a cracked porcelain mask like a doll's face. The third wore a small headdress resembling an Egyptian pharaoh's crown that also covered her upper face. John bowed, John bowed before the women. Evening ladies, he said. The butterfly mask woman took her spear, which had blades on both ends that were shaped like two arrowheads one of which was cut in half and fused to the bottom of the second, then hollowed out to make a gap big enough to fit a person's head, before being attached to the shaft. It was clear that the point she stood in was the white one, as it was barely visible from John's point of view. Long time no see, said the woman as she walked up to John. Too long, Zoe, replied John. It seems you've so far managed to escape the hell-bound hands of the Empire that wishes you dead. Then why else did your priestess call me the Undying Heart? Do you mind that I'm acting on business? We are too busy to joyfully reminisce. Yeah, you've been that way since Samuel died. If only that seductive temptress had left her claws off of him. I could have had his children. At least we'll give the girls a normal upbringing, instead of living in fear. How is Adele, by the way? Good and bad. She's become attracted to Raziel, and they've started dating. We found a sister, but it's too dangerous to actually go and get her. And now, the Empress passed the law that in order to keep the nation pure, all citizens of recent foreign and Aboriginal origin are to be executed. We were taken down, but we barely escaped by the skin of our teeth. However, they have a deal. As I speak, everyone back home is working on the plan. Even Adele's demonic uncle offered his services purely out of interest of protecting her from her mother. How do you know he is not deceiving you? Well, Raziel's somehow learned to read people's souls and he confirms that the demon speaks the truth. In a former life, he fought alongside Samuel as a brother in arms and he uses his mission to defend the girls as a way of avenging his comrade. Well, I can trust you to free her before they figure out what she is capable of. Well, don't worry, I trained her to defend herself, so I'm positive that whoever has her, she's putting up one hell of a fight. For all I know, she's broken out on her own accord and she's on her way home now. No, she is not, Matron. Zoe, John and Brooklyn turned to the crowned woman who stood in the green point. She took her spear, which had two curved blades intertwining like serpents, and waved her over the cauldron. Everybody gathered around her, with John taking a position in the red point, while Brooklyn and Zoe stood in their correct points. They all gazed into the bubbling water. I don't see anything, Chloe, said John. That's apothecary Chloe to you, and I did see her. Her body was twisted somehow. The goddess describes her as the fallen angel trapped between heaven and earth, bound to a slave's dress. Between heaven and earth and a slave's dress? asked John, as he unsheathed his scythe and held it over the water. Perhaps I can try something. Whatever I end up doing, it should be clear and staring into a pool. Brooklyn then nudged the doll-faced woman, who had a trident in the blue point. Treasure Sarah, document this. 
Sarah nodded and picked up a book that was sitting at her feet, and she prepared to write in it, watching with anticipation. Just know that I have no idea what the hell I'm going to do, said John, so watch out. John lowered the blade of his scythe into the middle of the water. The water turned black and stopped boiling. The flames underneath began to die down as the water froze in the black crystal. John removed the scythe and raised it up in the air, with the opal pointed towards the moon. The flames erupted and turned blue, and the ice began to rise out of the cauldron in columns, forming shapes. Eventually, it took the form of the floating island, with the intact version of the college sitting atop it. A small figure of a girl, whose detail was not precise enough to tell if it was Adele, was sitting on the edge of the roof, appearing to be writing in a book. A bird appeared from out of nowhere and landed just behind the girl. It took the form of a large woman who held a knife. The woman appeared to call for the girl, even though no sound came out. And the girl finished writing and stood up, turning to face the woman, who suddenly stabbed her through the chest. The woman tried to pull the knife out, but it seemed to be stuck, as if it was embedded in the girl's ribs and became like a sword into stone. The woman tripped and the girl fell off the building, crashing to the ground. At that instant, the ice shattered and reformed the image of an upside down crow with an upside down crucifix tattoo, with a knife impaling it from tail to head, before falling back into the cauldron and turning back in a crystal clear water. The fire turned back to orange and red, causing the water to boil again. The women just stared in shock and John looked up at the night sky. I hope this is a vision of the future and not the present, he said. Why hope for the future? asked the shaken Zoe. John sheathed his scythe again, because then I can change it. I have to return to Australia. Do you have any way to get me there? The women nodded and placed the tips of their spears on John's shoulders, chanting, Close your eyes and dream, but do not open them whatever you do. Now, Imagine that you walk amongst the waves in an endless ocean. There is no life flying in the sky above you. There is no land around you to hold life. There is no life swimming in the water below you. In this world, you are the only living being. Now, the waves start to pile up, crashing against you as if you were a rock under a cliff. The force of the waves slowly push you under the ocean and you fall to the depths. Sinking, sinking, sinking. The women's voices trailed off and faded away. John felt himself falling into water and he opened his eyes. He was standing on the bottom of a body of water, but it was too murky for him to see where he was. He started to swim upwards in desperation to reach the surface before he drowned. And washing ashore, exhausted and gasping for air, John looked around to see that he was crawling out of the lake at Mermaid Falls. In the distance, he could see the waterfall and the light of dawn. Realising his time was limited, he started to run home as fast as his weary legs could carry him. But shortly after, too confused to know where he was running, he blacked out. And those were chapters 13 and 14. Thank God it's the murder on my throat. Now, unlike when I've done chapters 5 and 6 a few months back, I've done these two in a single run instead of having an interval, so... For your convenience, the cross-section occurred when the rebels were getting dropped off at home, but that will make each chapter rather short. Now, there's not much to talk about for chapter 13 apart from the movie references, but chapter 14 is a fair bit deeper. The idea for the Lords of Salem came from the movie of the same name by Rob Zombie. I haven't watched it all and the plot summary I read online has made me decide not to. But when I heard that the movie was in development I instantly thought of the idea to have a coven of witches in Hell's Crusade. And in fact the whole Necrosis Chronicles. So yeah. Seeing as the majority of the main characters in my story are actually real people who are good friends of mine. I asked a few to see what they're for, and so, the four witches introduced in chapter 14 are all real friends of mine. If you're listening, hey girls, looking good. Shoutouts aside, moving on to the music credits. Starting out of chapter 13, Grim Reaper Lullaby, which was introduced in the previous chapter, 
plays during the intro with John and Brian's scene. As I mentioned in the last chapter, I heard it on another YouTube video, and I've managed to find it again. It's Matt Mulhall's Top 10 Creepy Pastors. And I downloaded the song from the Newgrounds site from a user called Coxacur. Not really sure how that's pronounced, but look it up. Anyway, after the scene when Raziel, Dante and Vincent are um, making their escape and wreaking havoc, Alice Madness Returns Combat Fiend makes her grand re-debut, and when everybody runs for the door, Metallica's escape plays until the crossover. This leads into chapter 14. So, when the Rebels are getting dropped off by Jack and Tanya, Diary of Undertaker begins playing. This is another song I downloaded off of Newgrounds that I heard in Matt Mulhall's video. And this song's by Yanni76. When John marches into the military base to stow away on a plane, a cover of Michael Jackson's Smooth Criminal plays for a short bit. And it was made by Alien Ant Farm. When John reached Salem and begins searching for the Lords, find your way from Final Fantasy VIII Returns. When John then enters Brooklyn's house, Beyond the Wasteland from Final Fantasy VII Advent Children begins to play. And this lasts until the end, but at one point, the hymn of the faith from Final Fantasy X can be heard. And this is in fact the game that John mentions regarding making a lullaby for his children. So yeah, I thought this was actually tying the Hell's Crusade as it took a lot of inspiration from Final Fantasy. Now the actual hymn of the faith in game is a grand choir of sorts, but each summoned monster, or which are called Aeons, in the game has their own version of the song. And the version of the hymn I've used actually the themes of Balafor, Shiva and Anima play together to make it sound like Zoe, Chloe and Sarah are actually singing. That's all for the music credits, so next time on Hell's Crusade, after I get my voice back and Mikey and Jack reveal their big secret, the Necros march to find Adele, what they find threatens to consume them all in Hellfire, and the Arc Demon Spearman must come to grips with what Adele and her sister's origins mean in the here and now. I am Necro Arcanist in association with Bandit1569, signing off. Stay classy, YouTube.